So please, can you take your seat? We are beginning to open the closing ceremony and award presentations. And uh, I have the pleasure to invite uh, Vincent de Ville de Goyer, who is the moderator of this uh, keynote uh, lecture given by Michel Verloger. And uh, he is the director of the Greish Company in uh, Belgium. So please, Vincent. To keep the people until the end of an event, it's important to organize the closing session as a firework display. With this idea, the organizing committee has asked to Michel Virlogeux to provide the final keynote. Michel Virlogeux chose to speak about the challenges of very long span bridges. I had the privilege to work with Michel on two major bridges, the Milo Viaduct and the third Bosphorus Bridge. So I am convinced that his keynote will explode ideas like a fireworks. Even if very few people do know him, he must be remembered that Michel Virlogeux has designed several dozen of prestigious bridges. Let's just mention a few only. The bridge of Ré Aislon, the Normandy Bridge, the first stay cable bridge with a main span of 864 meter long. It has been a world record during some years. The Milo Viaduct, of course, an exceptional and fantastic multi stay cable bridge. The Tenerife Bridge, a curved stay cable bridge with single leg pylons. The Chabon d'Almas lift bridge in Bordeaux. The third Bosphorus bridge. Without forgetting his participation in the construction of the second Tagus crossing in Lisbon. Michel Virlogeux has also been very active in technical associations such as the French Association of Civil Engineering the FIP, the International Federation for Priest Racing, the FIB, the International Federation for Structural Concrete. He has received many prestigious international awards as the YAPS Prize, the gold medal of the Institution of Structural Engineers, the Gustav Maniels Medal Awards from Belgium, and the first Leonard Prize, etc. There are many other for me, it was fantastic to collaborate with him on bridge design. And today, it's a pleasure to chair your keynote, Michel. Please, Michel. Thank you very much, Vincent. I shall try to do my best to, to, to do it. I shall start very quickly with some historic background. You see, the uh, suspension bridges started at the very end of the 18th century, and very quickly it was developed by the English engineers, uh, among which uh, Thomas Telford and Kingdom Isoma Brunel. But the, the big uh, jump forward was made by John Rubling with the Brooklyn Bridge, and in the 20th century with the Otmar Adman bridges. I just passed very quickly to, to, to show on this slide how far the, the, the span length passed from about 1,000 meter and to, to 2,000 meter in something like 70 years. A bit more, not 70 years. I, I go backwards and you see on the left side the George Washington Bridge designed by Otmar Atman and opened to traffic in the beginning 30s. Just a little detail. Initially, there was only one level of trust in this bridge. And after the Tacoma collapse, uh, Otmar Aman, considering that his bridge was not safe enough, erected the second le level, which was already anticipated. 
The record was broken by the Golden Gate Bridge with uh, almost uh, 300, uh, sorry, 1,300 meters uh, by Strauss, who had been intelligent enough to ask some co consultancy from Atman. And then uh, Atman was very, very, very old this time, in uh, 1964, took back his record with the Virazzano Bridge. And I shall come to this point later. The record was be beaten by a completely different design, the Amber Bridge with a streamlined box section. And just more recently, the record is just now taken by the Akashi Kaikyo Bridge in Japan, uh, uh, open to traffic in 98. In fact, we must go to the accident of the Takama Narrow Bridge, everybody knows, in November 1940. In the, per, per, in the very old bridges, the pioneer suspension bridges, there was very, very light decks. And it was very progressively that engineers tried to give some rigidity to the deck to avoid accidents due to high winds. But engineers considered that finally these big trusses that you have seen on the previous bridges were too large for, for, the, for even for long spans. And one of them, Leo Moseyev, considered that it was not necessary to have such a big structure and designed the Tacoma Bridge with two edge high girders connected by uh, cross beams and the slab. Unfortunately, as everybody knows, it collapsed due to what is now considered as a, a torsional instability. To give an idea of the reaction which was produced, you can see here the Tacoma Bridge, which has been replacing the old one. And you can see the two cross sections. In fact, it comes from aerodynamic problems, and engineers took some years to understand aerodynamic stability. And this is uh, a good way to go back to one of the very important technical revolutions of civil engineering. This is the development of streamlined box girders. There is a controversy, of course, between Germany and Great Britain because uh, uh, Fritz Leonard had the idea to make uh, very, very uh, slender decks, uh, and, but in fact, they were really uh, erected by Freeman Fox. The idea is very simple. In place of erecting bigger and bigger trusses to resist to bigger and bigger wind forces, the idea of uh, Leonard and the English engineers was to reduce wind forces by giving an adapted shape to the cross section and to give it a very high torsional rigidity by uh, uh, closed box sections. This is the second Severn, which has been built in 1966. This is then, just later, the first Bosphorus Bridge with a, a bit more than 1,000 meters erected in 1970. Free. And they passed to the world record at the time, which was the Humber Bridge with a span of more than 1,400 meters. You can see on this drawing the free cross section. The last one is much more rigid, much, the box grade is much deeper due to two reasons. First, the longer span and also the, the fact that uh, uh, the, 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 the width is uh, not as wide. We shall come back to sprint later. Just an idea to show which are today the longer uh, suspension bridges in the world. We have uh, 11, <coughs> 11 bridges with a span of more than 1,300 meters now, including four in China. The Virazzano and the Golden Gate bridges are still ranked 12 and 13. And in these 11 bridges, uh, these uh, nine have, uh, have a streamlined box order, and only two have still a truss as a deck. And it's very clear that the future is for the streamlined box girders. I pass very quickly now to cable-stead bridges. Situation is completely different. The, in 
60, 60 years, 65 years, we passed from zero to 1,000 meter. The record passed very progressively because engineers have been extremely shy, probably because the first experiences of cable state bridges in the 19th centuries have been, have been pure disasters with the collapse of the Tweed Bridge and the Saal Bridge just because the engineers at the time had not understood at all how, we, how they were working. To just give some examples to show that we were very far so, from the limit, I start with the world record in 75. This is the Saint-Nazaire Bridge, which is a steel autotropic box girder. And the record was curiously beaten by a pressed rest concrete bridge in Spain, the Carlos Fernandez Casado Bridge at Barrios de Luna. It's very surprising because the weight of a concrete, pressed rest concrete deck is about three times the weight of a steel autotropic box girder. And the record was then be beaten by a composite deck, which is something in between. It's one for steel autotropic, two for, to be roughly, two for a composite, three for a concrete bridge. And then again, it passed to a steel autotropic box in Japan with the Ikushi Bridge in 93. You can see that things are going quicker and quicker. And then it passed to concrete again in uh, Norway with the Skansun Bridge, which is still today the longest span in concrete. And then again to a composite bridge in China, the Yangpu Bridge in Shanghai, with a span of 608 meters. Just, just a, a little thing about it. You know, most of the composite cable state bridges are made of two high girders joined by a cross beam and a concrete slab. In fact, in this bridge, you have not two high girders, but two twin high girders, because these, uh, e these segments were assembled by bolting and not by welding. Personally, I prefer welding very much. But there was not enough place to put all the bolts, and so they have been in, uh, obliged to divide the high girders into two. And then this is finished. From now on, the world record was taken by the Normandy Bridge in 1995, 856 meters exactly. And this is finished. All now the long span bridges, long span cable set bridges have an autotropic box girder. The world record was beaten by the Tatara Bridge in 99, and then by the Sutong Bridge in China with a span of, I don't remember exactly, but I think it's 1,080 meters, something like this, with a second view of this very beautiful bridge partly inspired for the Normandy Bridge. And more recently, with the Ruski Island Bridge in Vladivostok with a span of 1,108 meters. I could also give another example of why uh, it was clear that uh, in the 70s when we fought the spans of the uh, cable state bridges was in the range of 400 meters, is the fact that in Germany already you had some very long span bridges with a span of between the, a bit less than 300 and a bit more, up to a bit more than 330, for example, the Düsseldorf Knie Brücke and the Düsseldorf Fleu, which, have, which had only one tower, and their spans were in fact equivalent to more than 600. Just a small view now of what are the longest spans of cable stead bridges in the world today. I cannot read very easily because it's so small on my screen, but we have now today 40 cable state bridges with a span of more than 500 meters and more. Of these 40, 40, 32 have been erected after 2000. It gives an idea of the explosive development of uh, cable state bridges. And on these 40 bridges again, 25 have been erected in China. This is in China today, that we have very much more uh, uh, cable state bridges erected today. Just uh, an idea to show how things have progressed. The Saint Nazaire Bridge, which was the world record in 1975, is now ranked only 102. So it's very, 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 very funny how, how quickly it passed and how things have changed. And since 
And after the Normandy Bridge has been erected, the very long span have all a streamlined box girder inspired from the suspension bridges. Another word now about hybrid bridge solutions. This is something rather exceptional today. It's not a new idea. If you look backwards, you will see that a John Rubling, a very great engineer of 19th century, has erected the a very interesting bridge across the Niagara River, which I think was in wood, I'm not very sure. I heard it was in wood. And it's a two-level truss. And in this case, the trains are at the upper level, and the cars, but it's all cars at the time, or cars, were at the lower level. And Robling reused this concept of associating state cables and suspension cables for the Brooklyn Bridge. Why this association? It was, as I said already before, that at the time, engineers have not completely understood the major role of the deck rigidity. And many bridges had collapsed in the 19th century, everywhere in the United States, in France, everywhere, due to extreme winds, because there was not something to carry the wind loads. And in order to, as the decks had, were not so rigid, Robling, who was a very good engineer, has realized that stay cables gave, can give much more rigidity to the deck, at least vertically, than a suspension system with suspension cables and hangers. And he associated the two. You could say, I just, it's an occasion to say that uh, of course, it's extremely highly hyperstatic, and you can say, how could have he designed such a bridge without a computer? It's just because he had some brain between his two ears, and he has been able to manage that without a computer, as every good engineer can do. You can see some other examples. This is a small example in France. I don't know exactly where it is. It's uh, Jean-Francois Klein who discovered that on the internet. And you see in, in this bridge, which is not designed like the Rubling Bridge, you have first a purely cable-state part and directly after a purely suspended part. Now going to, to the Bos third Bosphorus Bridge. This idea of association of cable-staying and suspension systems was abandoned, why? just because engineers had understood the role of the deck and have designed deck with high rigidity such that it was not necessary to add stay cables. Why have we, Jean-Francois and I, in a very short time, because I've received the phone call to, to work with this project in the 22nd of February 2012, and we had to give the, the bid with Jean-Francois on the 26th of April, a very, very short time, starting from a white sheet. Why? It's because the Turkish government required a suspension bridge. This was written like this. But asking for two major goals they have. One, a very good architecture. And two, shapes in similarity with the shapes of the uh, exist, two existing bridges on the Bosphorus. And I knew that uh, for the contract for the first Bosphorus bridge was, gi be, was given by the Turkish government without any competition because they had seen the, uh, they had seen the, the, the seven bridge in Great Britain and considered that it was much more elegant than the big trusses. So we were convinced that it was not a good idea to erect a bridge which was to carry eight motorway lanes and two railway tracks. It was not a good idea to make a truss with two levels with the trains at the lower level and the motorway at the upper level. It gives very heavy structures, which are 
by no way elegant in my opinion, and by no way similar to the two existing bridges on the Bosphorus, which are very elegant. Then we made the decision to put the railways and the motorways at the same level with a streamlined box girder, which of course is almost 60 meters wide now, and which is deeper than the other ones due to the presence of the train. Why this this starting decision, if I, can, I shall come back later to the project more. If you look on this drawing, on the top you have a pure suspension bridge. When the train is passing at quarter pan, the deck deflects downwards and the cable deflects very surprisingly. It goes down on the side where is the train and up on the other side. This means that the suspension cables try to escape the load, and so the deflection is very large. Another option would have been a purely cable state bridge, but it was not permitted by the competition, which, which was sp speaking of a suspension bridge. So we proposed uh, this hybrid solution with stake cables, which can drive directly the load from the train at quarter span to the top of the tower, and as we have designed very rigid side spans, the details are not there, it's going back in the backstays, and so it can reduce the deflection of the main span in very high proportion, at least a factor two and probably more. I mainly pushed for this solution, and uh, as it was not very good, I was just leaving for taking vacation in the Caribbean at this moment, and when I was away, Jean-Francois Klein made a, a splendid design for the tower with inclined legs, which give a very unusual shape for a suspension bridge, extremely elegant, but with a small drawback, is that as we need to have the suspension cables and the angles in vertical planes, it has been necessary to place the angles and suspension cable on both sides of the roadways in the middle of the deck, of course, to limit torsional effects, and with the roadways on each side. Of course, this means, as you will see, that in the central part of the main span, we have not a very high torsional rigidity. It comes only for the southern torsion rigidity and not at all for the suspension. The team has been increased by the addition of Gresh, with, uh, with our chairman now, uh, and uh, some other design offices, but the main team was made by T-Engineery, Gresh, and me uh, only as consultant because uh, I'm just alone, as you know. What is the result? We must now look how is organized the suspension. We have a purely uh, suspended part in the main span with angles on both sides of the railway tracks. Close to the tower, we have, we have a purely cable state part with stay cables anchored at the deck edges in order to produce the torsional rigidity that we need absolutely in the main span. And in between, we have a transition zone in which we have in the same time stay cables and angles. Why? It's because, as I have shown, the cable stead system is much more rigid than the suspension system, and if we have passed brutally from a cable stead part to a suspension part, we should have a differential rigidity between the two parts and probably a concentration of bending moment. And so we prefer to have a progressive transition between the two, which is what we call the transition zone. Now looking to side spans. We have first the first part, and there the stay cables are anchored on each side of the roadways. It's not for the pleasure, it's just because, you see, the, the stay cables are very big. The, um, the bigger ones are made of, uh, I don't remember, it's 151 or 155 uh, strands. You must ask to the uh, Fresine booth, they will tell you. And so it would not have been possible to anchor these cables at the deck edges because it would have been a too high force to introduce there. And so they have been anchored in the webs, which is not the best idea. It's uh, something I would have changed if, uh, 
if I make another one, it will not, not be exactly like this to have an easier access to, to the anchorages. But we could not place all stake cables in side spans because the, the site has very, very stiff uh, slopes on each side and we have not enough length. And so we have been obliged to anchor the last stake cables directly in the ground with some provision, with a very big counterweight on which the we, railway tracks will pass and the, the roadways pass directly on the ground. This has a direct consequence on the design and, the, and on the distribution of the balance of forces. If I look at the 17 pairs of stake cable in the main span and the 17 pairs on the side spans which are corresponding, the balance is perfect because each stake cable is taking the load of the corresponding segment. It drives it to the tower at top. And then you have the horizontal action, which is the horizontal component of this force. And on the side span, you have to produce a tensile force in the stake cable, which is higher to produce the same horizontal force in such a way that your tower is strictly vertical and with no bending moment and a permanent loads. And of course, automatically, horizontal force are balanced on both sides. But it stops. When you look at the five last pairs of stake cables, because on the main span, they are anchored on the deck, and the side span directly in the ground. So you have no horizontal action in the, uh, produced by the anchorage of this cable is the, in, in the ground to balance the horizontal effect in the main span. And this horizontal effect can only come by a tensile force at mid-span. This bridge is a hybrid bridge, and in the cable system, we have not a classical balance of horizontal forces on both sides of the tower. The balance is made by a tensile force of about 8,000 tons in the central part of the main span. I don't speak of the balance of a suspension system. It's absolutely classical. This has also effect on the passage of unsymmetrical loads, and especially trains. What happens? We've, we have a train, which is in the, the, the quarter span on one side. Of course, we have displacements. We have forces which are not balanced exactly as before. But very clearly, we have a, a tension variation in the five last stake cables, which cannot be balanced by anything. So it is clear that as we have refused having a fixed point somewhere to avoid concentrating seismic forces at one point, the deck will move. And of course, this movement was too large due to the weight of trains, and we have to find solution to reduce it. The first part of this reduction comes from the cable system. Since the bridge moves, some stake cables have an increased tensile force, some a decreased tensile force, which is limiting the displacement. But we have added pendular bearings. Pendular bearings, which work by both actions, one by friction, and in this case, the friction is useful. This is a bit of a problem because the Euro code is not based on, the, on this way of working. And in, it is also helping creating a reaction, an inclined reaction, due to the displacement by the rotation of the nut. To give an idea, these uh, big uh, pandura bearings have been provided by uh, Mageba, and the, the bigger one is, is very, I don't remember the, its weight, uh, I will not say it. And so it's a, it's a bit complicated to see how it works, and uh, uh, of course, when it turns, it, there is also a slight vertical movement that we have to, to balance properly. All this has also consequences on the aeration steps. First, we erect the side span on, uh, classically on scaffolding, the very typically Turkish construction with match Pearson. Turkish work very, very hard and very well. After that, we, may, we erect, we have erected the 
considerable part we, 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 uh, the, f the first uh, part of the main span by the cantilever method for the 17 first stay cables. And at this moment, we are balanced. Of course, we create a temporary connection at the abutment to avoid movement in the case of high winds of earthquakes. But then it's, it becomes more difficult when we place the additional five. In fact, we could place only three at this moment due to pure geometrical reason of uh, conflict between the geometry of the suspension cable, which, was, which has a big sag at this moment in the side span because it was not loaded, and the cables. So, uh, because, and then this horizontal force, which cannot be transferred by a tensile force in the main span, had to be balanced by at the abutment, and so we, due to the installation of this new cable, the deck is pushed against the abutment. After that, we have erected, we shall come back to that uh, later a bit, uh, we have erected the central part with a suspension system, as you will see, until we have just to place the last segment. And then, at this moment, we, have to, we had to use a big series of jacks to push, only on one side was enough, to push half the bridge against the closing segment to weld everything, and when we release the jacks, automatically the tensile force came in the central part of the span. Now, a very specific problem we had. You can see on the left the erection of the Golden Gate Bridge, where the deck has been erected by the cantilever method from the tower. In the modern cable in suspension bridges, sorry, the deck is erected from mid-span. Why? It's because before you start erecting the suspended part, the suspension cable, which are only loaded by their self-weight, are very high. I don't remember, Vincent, I think it was 20 meters? Yeah. 20 meters higher than the final position. And if you progressively put the load, the deck goes down and down and goes automatically toward this position. Perhaps not exactly, but very close to. And so it is solving the problem. Unfortunately, we could not do it. To be honest, initially we thought we could do it, but uh, it was not possible, because due to the fact that the uh, stay cables and hangers are on both sides of the uh, uh, railway tracks, uh, there is a very, very small torsional rigidity, and this was totally unstable. So we have been obliged to erect the central part from the cantilever, the cable state cantilevers. And of course, we have a cable much higher. So it has been necessary to use some temporary angles and to develop some erection steps, this was done by Vincent, to lo progressively lower the suspension cables. And after having placed three to four segments, I don't remember exactly, it was then possible to directly use the final angles. A little detail also, it is necessary to place, yeah, j'ai un petit problème, to place directly, uh, to place at the same time two, two segments, one on each side, to avoid a longitudinal displacement of the, uh, of the uh, suspension cables due to, uh, uh, as you have seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the sketch at the beginning. Uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, there is a slide which disappeared. And uh, I've only, uh, I lost one uh, slide of the bridge, of the completed bridge. You, this is one here. It has been open to traffic in August 2016. Why this explosion of very long span now? There are several reasons. The first one is that we have already built what was easy to build. And so we have left only the most difficult one. Then also contracting companies are now bigger and bigger, and they have much more means to erect things now than they had before. There is also a constant progress in materials, tensile force in stake in cables and suspension cables, uh, concrete, and so on. 
The development of information technology helps very much making things, but it's only a tool. I remind, the best, the first tool is the brain. And uh, the main reason for me is a much better knowledge of uh, natural forces. This means today we are much more able than we were 40 years ago to predict wind effects, seismic effects. Now, some words about design evolution. One big evolution is connected to a critical point. This is the span to width ratio. Uh, until we were at rather limited span length, we, can, we could direct deck with a span to width ratio of, for example, 40 for the Normandy Bridge. But with greater and greater span, it's not enough. You cannot have enough width to resist the horizontal displacement, the horizontal effect of wind. So an idea which has been launched many years ago, I think it, uh, by somebody who's Richardson, but I'm not sure, but was to divide the deck into several box girders. What you see here is the uh, uh, drawing, the concept, which has been developed for the, to cross the Messina Strait with a span of 3,200 meters, which is just now only a paperwork, but you have three uh, box girders, one on each side for the roadways and one in the central part for the railways. This, has been, this idea has been reused, for example, for the Stonecutters Bridge by Arup, uh, with a span of a bit uh, 1,000 meters, who has never been the world record because the Sutong Bridge was erected so quickly that they passed in front. And here, another view. You see, I pass now to another example. This is the project we have developed with T Engineering. First, for uh, Ixtas, it was the, the Turkish company of the Third Bosphorus Bridge, with, to, for a new bridge which will be erected with a span of 2,023 meters. This is the elevation with a purely suspended solution. And this is the cross section with twin box girders. We reproduce, we have later been called by the winning group, which was not Ishtas, but it was a Turkish group made of uh, uh, Yapi Merkezi, uh, Limak, and two Koreans, uh, Dailim and Eska. And we made also a, a, an hybrid solution in which the two Turkish companies were interested to reduce the erection time and which was also interesting, Fresine, uh, who is a, a company which is very connected to Yapi Merkezi, because of course they would, it would help them uh, using, uh, producing much more stay cables. And we made, with the CSTB and the consultancy of Gerard Griot, comparisons of results, aerodynamic stability. First, a unique deck, a disaster, the stability, uh, the critical velocity for stability is less than 60 meters per second. And then we made two analyses, one with a limited distance between the two box girders, about seven meters, which give a very high uh, stability. And we have an high, even higher stability with a longer distance. But when the distance increases, automatically you increase the drag forces because when the distance becomes very large, the uh, second deck is not in the wake of the first one. Another idea is the development of cable stead bridges with multiple spans. I will not insist very much. This is the Mio Vaduct with some beautiful slides. You have also the Rio Antirion bridge with a fully suspended deck from one abutment to the other one. And the last example, which is today the longest composite span of about 650 meters. This is the first or fourth bridge, bridge replacement. Just to give an idea, today I think that the reasonable limit for concrete cable state bridges is about 500 meters. For composite bridges, about 700 meters, 600, 700. And after that, you have to pass to uh, autotropic box girders. Q 
curved cable set bridges, uh, Yabegawa Bridge in Japan, uh, on which I slightly worked. All the problem on these bridges, and this is especially the case for the Tennis Bridge, is to organize a good balance of load in the tower. The inclination of the tower is designed in such a way that under permanent loads, there is in the tower only a normal force without no bending moment. A last word to finish with this lecture, with traffic loads. One of very strong handicaps for long span bridges is the codes with traffic loads. Some codes are, I um, really mean what I say, are absolutely stupid. I think that those who are writing loads are confusing local loads and global loads. Local loads, when you have uh, an autotropic deck, it's absolutely clear that the axle or vehicle are passing one after the other on each very small span. The, the influence line is about 400, uh, four, four meter long. And of course, the fact that you have trucks with loads more than, in the, than officially, it's important and is something which is to be considered for the, for the fatigue design on an autopic deck. But then you look to the global load on the deck, where, the, for example, for the, the influence line of the tensile force in the stay cable is 400 to 500 meters, it is absolutely out of scale with what is in the codes. You have here a table which was done by, by Vincent, where you compare different things, and you can see that there is enormous differences between the different codes. And the reasonable codes are the code which has been developed in uh, Portugal for, by, by the NEC, also by the Swedish, Tecabro, uh, and we had to discuss a long, long time with our Turkish colleague to obtain from the KGM to accept a load which was rather reasonable as compared to that. And the worst is the British standard, which is absolutely crazy. And I finish to just some views of the future world record. This is the Kanakale Bridge. What you see here is a rendering of the winning team. I say again, it's Yapi Merkezi, Limac, uh, Dailim, and SK. And this is the solution, the hybrid solution that we have proposed with Jean-Francois, as a solution, which was not accepted, unfortunately, by this group, because the Korean colleagues were too anxious for the supposed complication of the solution, which is, in my opinion, very efficient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel, for not for your keynote, but for the, your lessons concerning the uh, very long span bridges. I uh, imagine that now there are many uh, comments or questions to, uh, to Michel concerning this uh, subject. Nobody? Ah, it's a, a bit surprising. Merci beaucoup. Could you give your, your name? Yes. Guy. Bonjour, je suis Guy Larose uh, from uh, RBDI in Canada. Yeah. Monsieur Villeleu, I, I thank you very much for a fantastic le lecture. Uh, my question is, is there also um, a desire to increase not only the span, but also increase the design life? So the, uh, can you touch about this? Like, are we building bridges for 100 years? Or can we think that we can do it for 120 years or going to maybe 200 years? Well, it's absolutely clear that for very, very expensive bridges like this, it's better that the life is longer. But this is a, a, a bit of a different question. 
This is a question which is directly connected, for example, for the design of the autot autotropic slab. It's clear that, uh, uh, and it's some, uh, a place where you can really make a fatigue analysis and make a prediction. For the rest, the problem is the quality of concrete when you have uh, uh, concrete structures. So it's not connected to, 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 to in my opinion, to the span. The, 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 the life, uh, lifetime depends on the quality of construction, of what you have taken as assumption for the places, for the parts of the bridge in which you can predict the real life, and also from the later inspection and maintenance that you develop. Another question here, please. Hi, for that third Bosphorus, you just had a pure suspension form. Um, could you have, at uh, what depth would the box girder have been? Would it have been massively deeper or look too heavy or? Um, uh, I think, I, I have not the precise figure. I think the first Bosphorus bridge uh, uh, has a structural depth of about three meters. The Bosphorus is 5.5 because there is a train. But uh, practically, many, many uh, long span bridges today, which are purely roadway bridges, have a structural depth of about three meters, with the exception of the Humber Bridge. Another question? So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Oh, no. Ah. Lennart Edwin from Sweden. What, what do you think of uh, carbon reinforced polymer as an exchange of steel materials to reduce the white of the. Uh, this uh, is a good question, and I, I forgot to say something. What, what is the limit of span for cable state bridges? And this limit is directly connected to the weight of cables and to the span. Being clear that uh, f today, the world record is a bit 11 meter, and I remember that uh, in the uh, 80s, I think, or perhaps a bit in the late 80s, uh, COE has made a, a cable stead option for the uh, store belt with a span of 1,200 meters. And they asked me to, to give an opinion, and I can say that uh, this solution was perfectly feasible. The single difficulty was erection because it was necessary to have a temporary support inside span, but it's possible. So 1,200 meters is very, very possible today. After that, I remind that uh, Leonard had uh, made a project with a very long span for the Messina Strait. I think it's 1,700 meters, something like this. But of course, there was a problem of sag. And then he had put cross cables we have cross cables in the Normandy Bridge, but to avoid vibration. In this case, it was to increase the rigidity of the system, and in fact, it was no more a classical cable set bridge, but it was uh, a mesh of, of cables. So, well, what is uh, the, the, the option, other option, of course, is a plastic material. Honestly, I'm not very fond of that, because, uh, you know, steel has a big, a big disadvantage of corrosion but as a big advantage of ductility. And I'm not sure uh, that uh, we have such a ductility with this polymer material, especially if you have transverse forces. The last question. The last question. Yeah, it's not a technical question, it's more personal. Um, you said you had two months to make the project for this bridge. So in two months, you have not the time to make all the calculation, to check everything. There are a lot of unknowns. Uh, does the constructor will be able to build the bridge. So how does it feel in the mind of a designer at this moment when you have the project that is breaking some records and technically you don't know if it's totally feasible. There, there are some doubts maybe. So what's in the mind in the, desi of, in the designer head? Well, I, don't, you know, it, 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 I didn't feel so bad, I can guarantee. <laughs> I, and Jean-François and I, we are very confident, and uh, Thierry is there, you can also ask him, I, I don't remember, I have seen him some minutes ago. Uh, we were very, first of all, 
uh, TNG and E had the time to make preliminary computation. Not, of course, a final computation, but they developed computation very quickly. Today, with the modern tools uh, we have, it's possible to make computation rapidly. And we had anticipated many things. It's clear that we have made some shortcuts. To give examples, at the time, the side spans were in steel, and the towers were also in steel, because uh, it was easier to make it in two months. But we discussed after that with the, the concessionaire, because we are working for Ixtas and Astaldi, and the concessionaire uh, said, OK, we prefer uh, concrete for the side spans because it will be cheaper. We prefer a tower in concrete for, to, to, to start much quicker, because you must not forget that there was a big boss behind. It was Mr. Erdogan, the, the president. And Erdogan had fixed the, uh, the integration date from the beginning. We, we could save one year, fortunately, because really his first process it was impossible. But we were under the pressure. Honestly, we have anticipated many things. For example, we knew from the beginning that there will be a tensile force at mid-span. We, we, we have not thought at the beginning that it will be necessary to start the central part from the cantilevers. We thought we shall start from the middle. But altogether, we have not made, I think, wrong uh, anticipations. OK. Thank you very much again, Michel, for your presentation. And, and here, a book not to explain the design of a bridge, but uh, I think of uh, tall towers. OK, thank you very much well, for attending well, this uh, closing ceremony. It's always very difficult well, to go after Michel Vurlejeu, so I have a difficult task now. Especially because, well, I, I'm not going, well, to show you, well, nice figures and uh, very uh, uh, impressive, uh, impressive designs. I, I'm just going, in fact, well, to give you, well, some uh, records regarding, well, the conference and uh, especially uh, what has been made, well, through in, um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of scientific and technical activities, well, during, well, these three days and uh, I have to include, well, the day before where uh, we had several workshops. And as I said, in fact, well, uh, prior to the conference, well, we uh, decided to, um, well, initiate uh, a sort of pre-conference uh, with three workshops. The first workshop, well, is related to forensic engineering, structural failures, well, cases, causes, and investigations. Lessons and lessons. Well, it was driven by John Dunterman, Fabrizio Palmisano, and Robert Rate, and uh, well, 19 participants joined them uh, in order well to discuss about uh, the forensic engineering. Uh, the second workshop was about designing with uh, ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete uh, based on uh, uh, the most advanced uh, standards. It was well uh, managed by Francois Toulmond and several uh, other people. I'm not going to uh, list uh, all of them. And uh, it involved well 18 participants. And the third workshop, and I shall leave well uh, uh, time for some words regarding this workshop uh, to Claude Le Quiré and Didier Gut uh, later, uh, was about the practice of finite elements calculation. And uh, 37 participants uh, joined uh, this workshop where, uh, well, they discuss about, well, uh, the practice of finite elements, but also, well, contributed, well, to a, co uh, to a competition. And I shall leave, well, Claude, well, to, uh, uh, to say some, something about, well, the results of this uh, competition. Well, we had also some technical visits. Uh, well, the wind tunnel t uh, facility well, of the CSTB and the uh, swell basin of the Ecole Centrale de Nantes uh, with 34 participants. So geotechnical centrifuge pavement for big test, well, all the test facilities at uh, IFSTAR with 11 participants. Saint-Nazaire Bridge that has interested, well, uh, 
roughly well 30 participants and the Chevire Bridge with uh, uh, a bit less than 20 participants. And of course, well, we had a visit of uh, the new railway station of Nantes with uh, uh, a bit less than 15 uh, participants. So you see, well, uh, technical activities, very active uh, uh, vi technical visits in order to show, well, some uh, facilities, but also some bridges and uh, uh, technical features when in Nantes. I'm coming now well, to the conference itself. Well, we had six uh, prestigious uh, keynotes, so I think it's uh, very important, and I understand that they have all been recorded, so uh, I hope well uh, to uh, make it available on the higher BSC website well uh, soon. We had in some time well 64 parallel sessions, uh, so uh, we received for uh, making this uh, 64 parallel sessions something like 500 uh, abstracts, and uh, well 460 were 60 were uh, accepted. So this led to uh, a bit more than 300 papers and to get at the end, well, uh, 300 finalized papers. And you had, well, uh, a bit less because of course some papers are, are withdrawn uh, usually. You have, well, uh, 295 papers, well, in the, in the program, maybe a little more uh, in, uh, in the proceedings. And overall, uh, we have uh, welcomed uh, 575 attendees. I'm not fully sure about, well, uh, the, th this number, this figure, but, well, a bit less than 600 uh, participants. So if you have a look, well, on the geographical origin of attendees and speakers, well, it's more or less the same. Of course, well, you have, well, uh, a huge number of participants coming from Europe uh, and uh, after from Asia is the same, well, if it is attendees or if it is uh, speakers, maybe you have more attendees from European countries than you have speakers. And uh, so the percentage are, uh, but anyway, this percentage are roughly the same. So what we have achieved? Well, uh, if you remember, well, of course, well, the theme, the theme of, the, uh, of the conference was about mega structures of tomorrow. Well, if you go back, well, to the leaflet, well, it was written that the mega structure is a very large, well, artificial object. In fact, well, a, a large self-supporting artificial construction. And in fact, well, uh, today, well, tomorrow is already today because some of them are already finished or under construction. If you have a look back, well, to the lectures, well, you will see that it is, uh, it is truth. And, well, I have just here shown some um, structures that are finished or uh, under construction. And, of course, we have a large a large view of new structures, well, uh, floating tunnels, well, uh, very high-rise uh, towers, floating cities that have been presenting, uh, presented I'm sorry, during uh, these three days. But this macro scale uh, cannot be possible without working at a micro scale. And this is why that, well, not all the papers were dedicated to present one megastructure or a set of megastructures, but in fact also how to calculate, how to design, how to build this uh, macro, these megastructures. So this is why that a lot of papers were dedicated to calculation methods, design, techniques, equipments, materials, construction techniques, because, well, it's very nice to design megastructure, but the main question is how to build it. And of course, well, and this is now more and more common, sometimes, well, especially in buildings, sometimes, well, you have to take into consideration, uh, well, some historical part, some uh, existing parts, and you need to reassess, you need, in fact, to build upon them, and uh, you need to strengthen uh, these uh, structures. So this conference has provided a wide spectrum of such, what I call micro-scale subjects, that have been successfully applied to micro-studies. So I hope that you enjoy these three days, maybe these four days, for those who join the workshops. 
And well, I, I should like that, uh, I hope that you are going to keep well a, a pleasant uh, memory of these uh, three days. And I should like to, to wish you a, a nice trip back before uh, to give well the different awards uh, we selected uh, during these three days. Thank you very much. So as I said, well, uh, the first uh, awards, we, we had in fact two, uh, two set of awards, Young Engineer Awards and my thesis in 100, 180 seconds. For the Young Engineer Awards, uh, you have in two prizes. So uh, with uh, André Orsesi, well, uh, we, and of course with all the chair of the sessions, who uh, in fact have scored all the candidates based on the writing part, based on the papers, but also on their presentations. And we have selected, well, from the scores, well, the two best papers. So the papers will receive the highest scores. So the winners, for uh, IABSC uh, conference, well, in Nantes, are Catherine Poirier from Passage Projects, <laughs> about well, a lightweight megastructure, the design and construction of a 100 meter span dome in Mania, and Margot Ferringhetti about well, the optimization design of seismic isolation system for existing bridges from a centre in Pavia in Italy. So I should like to ask them to come if they are still participating. At least I see Catherine Poirier. Okay, so I don't think that Marco Fungetti is, uh, is attending well uh, this uh, closing ceremony, so anyway, we shall inform him about, well, uh, the prize. On uh, Wednesday evening, there was a, a special session called my PhD uh, thesis in uh, 180 seconds with 11 uh, PhD students. And uh, well, uh, they, they really uh, played the game and they try well to present in three minutes well uh, their work and uh, they manage very well their time and uh, we were all impressed about well the quality of course of their thesis but also about their presentation. So we, we have three prizes or three awards. So the first, the second and the third prize and I should like, well, to, uh, to present, well, the third prize. So the third prize has been given to Ellen Fairclough from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. I don't know if she's here. So for the second prize, uh, for my thesis in uh, 180 seconds, I should call Dominik Skokandic from the University of Zagreb in Croatia.
And finally, world's the first prize winner is Konstantinos Kalfas from City University of London in United Kingdom. Is he here? Oh, he lost his prize. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, in fact, well, we, uh, we have now well, uh, delivered well, the different uh, awards, and I should like well, to, Claude, to, to call Claude Le Quiré. Uh, she has, in fact, well, some, uh, some message about well, the workshop practice uh, of finite elements uh, calculations. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Claude. Uh, I am a member of the French Association of Civil Engineering since 12 years. And in 2015, together with Didier Gut from Arcadis, we accepted to manage a working group uh, working on FEM modeling in civil engineering. Uh, and last Thursday, uh, last Tuesday, sorry, uh, more than 20 young engineers took part of a competition. Uh, they were from uh, nine countries. They had different softwares. Um, and we asked them to modelize a simple, rather simple, uh, industrial steel structure and to answer uh, at uh, three questions three values uh, had to be given, and the modeling was only in two, two hours. Uh, we analyzed the dispersion of the results, which was huge, <laughs> and we debated together on this dispersion to, to see how, uh, uh, how the choices in the modeling could affect the results. Uh, it was a very nice day to, to talk together. Uh, we, we conclude that uh, uh, we should never trust our software, never. Uh, I'm sorry, but we had no winner. Nobody has uh, all the three good answers. But there was uh, no loser. Uh, all engineers were awarded for their involvement. For, the, for playing the, the game and received a, a gift. So thank you to all of you to, to playing the game, to, to, to having uh, discussed with us. Um, we will try to, to put the, the subject on an online page, maybe, and to, uh, to survey more answers, to see the, if the dispersion <laughs> uh, increased or decreased. Um, thank you also to the organization team because the day was very, very good organized. So thank you to uh, all the team. Thank you to you. Okay, so we are more or less at the end of this, um, of this uh, closing ceremony and I should like well to... Uh, to call well, uh, Professor Branco uh, for the closing uh, speech uh, from IABSC. Fernando. Well, it's over. <laughs> we have spent uh, three nice days here. We have discussed a lot. We have discussed new ways to modeling structures, as you have just seen. You, we have discussed uh, new ways to monitor structures, to repair structures, to discuss accidents of structures. 
uh, and at the end we have a magnificent presentation about the state of art of the long span of the bridges that are our uh, jewel of civil engineering, let us say. Did we learn a lot? Perhaps not, but it's not important. What is important is uh, that idea that you have seen in a session that can help you at home to solve your problem. Is that construction technique that you can apply in your construction work to solve another problem. It's those small things that you see in a session that you find in a discussion with a colleague that you just met in a coffee break that are the big issues of this conference. Are, is the connections, are the new ideas. That is the important part. So now you, we all go home till next conference and you have time to apply these new ideas at home in your profession. This is the main goal of IAPS. Thank you very much. So Professor Branco will uh, uh, say some words about, well, other conferences, so there is a life after Nantes. So, and I should like well to invite well uh, two uh, two organizers well of the two next uh, the next conferences, uh, one in Guimarães well uh, in, in March next year, and in New York well in September next year. So I should like to call well Jose Matos uh, Matos well in uh, uh, first, and then Jonathan Mank uh, Comley. Uh, chair of the scientific committee for uh, for New York, well, uh, to uh, present a little, well, uh, these two events. So, Jose. So, good afternoon. I think I have here the presentation. Yes. Should be. Okay. So, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all, uh, to welcome the president of YAPSE, Fernando, uh, and of course, Christian and Bruno, for this successful uh, symposium in Nantes. It was a very and fantastic symposium with a lot of uh, hints for Guimarães. And uh, I also like to acknowledge uh, the, all the support from the national, uh, national groups of uh, YAPS that uh, during these days approached me and uh, they were very enthusiastic with uh, this uh, symposium in Portugal, not only about the topics, but also about the country and the place. The symposium in Portugal will be from 27 to 29 of March 2019 and uh, will be in Guimarães, in Portugal. For those that don't know, Guimarães is uh, very well connected to Porto so, and to the airport in Porto. So, you don't be afraid in 30 minutes with a taxi or a Uber, you can, you can come to, to Guimarães. You have also bus, you have also trains, so there's not uh, an issue here. Uh, the, the three main uh, organizers is, uh, or the two main organizers is the Institute of Sustainability and Innovation in Structural Engineering from university, and also the YAPSE Portuguese National Group. The organizing committee is uh, co-shared by me and uh, Professor Lorenzo that is seated in the first row and I also like to acknowledge him. And also by a set of colleagues from Mingo but also from other institutions all over the, the, the country. And uh, I also 
like to pay your attention because there, there are two representatives from industry, from a contractor and from an owner, the biggest owner in Portugal, that accepted to take part of this organizing committee. In terms of scientific committee, I also, there will be a huge number of uh, people from different parts of the world that accepted to, to cooperate with us. And I would like also to, to acknowledge we received more than 400 abstracts. So I know that is a huge task and for paper reviewer will be also a huge task. And uh, in the name of uh, Luis Oliveira Santos, the chairman of the scientific committee, I would like to acknowledge all of you and give my energy to all members of scientific committee to do your best revision as possible. So this is the schedule. Uh, we have uh, three full days with five keynote speakers. We have uh, a welcome day on Tuesday and we have uh, on Saturday the most uh, important the technical visits, which is also very relevant. Uh, there is a program for um, young engineers, I'm going to speak later. In terms of topics, we have uh, common topics, but we also have innovative topics that I think there were a lot of, of them discussed here, related with management, with life cycle, with risk, and uh, sustainability. So this is, I would say, the, the most important trends. These are the keynote speakers uh, covering all these, uh, these uh, topics from uh, industry, from an owner to university, to research, to consultants. So I think it will be very promising. There will be 16 special sessions that were submitted and uh, also covering many topics. And I would like to acknowledge all the, organi or all the organizers because it was really some of these sessions I'm really keen to, to, I cannot mean all of them, but I'm really keen to, to, to attend. In terms of young engineers, we're going to have uh, two awards of 1,000 euros for, uh, for the best uh, presentation and, and, and the best papers. And also, we're going to organize a happy hour. An happy hour that will be in the cloisters of Alberto Sampaio Museum. And during this uh, AP hour, we're going to have a quiz where we'll join the young and the older. And uh, it will be a very ice-breaking uh, opportunity to meet each other and uh, discuss also the old and the future trends in uh, structural engineering. I would also like to pay your attention for the tank. This is uh, something new. Uh, the idea here is to combine those students or, or uh, researchers or uh, professors or uh, consultants that have ideas and do not, cannot go further with these ideas because they do not have uh, the investment and uh, combine them in a session with investors from industry that will give a shot and uh, we'll take these ideas for industry and for, uh, for the future also very important of uh, structural engineering. So those who are here, both from one side and from the other side, I invite you to go to the website and uh, see the more information about it. I think it will be a very huge opportunity to, to see some very interesting ideas coming up. The welcome reception will be in the Ducal Palace of the Braganza. It's the, the residential area of the King of Portugal. We don't have an official king, but it's uh, the palace of the castle uh, of, of the king. It will be on the 26th of March. There will be the prayer registration at 4 p.m. There will be a visit that is included from 4.30 to 5, to all the palace. The palace will be open, so, but there will be a, some guided visit. And then we have a cocktail, and we have also a medieval performance with Celtic music. Also, during the welcome, it will be uh, awarded the Bert Philp Y Prize. So this is a special moment that uh, for bridge engineers, also where uh, the, the, the prize will be given 
and I think it will be also memorable for, for all of us. The gala dinner will be on the 28th. It is a place, very nice place, overlooking Guimarães, seeing the green uh, wine region, seeing the city. And we're going to have uh, Portuguese folk music on the appetizers, and then a nice music band for the last moment of the dinner. In terms of technical visits, there are two visits programmed, one uh, which is a plane with structures. We want to visit the Braga Stadium from the principal architect, Soto Moura, and you're going to have an opportunity to have a football match there. And uh, the technical visit B, it's the bridges of Porto. We're going to see the new Porto Lations Cruise Terminal, and then take a boat tour through the Douro River, where you can visit, uh, you can see the Porto bridges and take uh, port wine during the tour. The registration, we have uh, several uh, possibilities. I will ask your attention for the 15th of December, which is an important date. And it includes uh, the proceedings, uh, book of proceedings, the bag, Includes the access to exhibition, lunch, coffee breaks, welcome reception, happy hour, the social tours in uh, Guimarães. We, we will offer to all participants a free tour to the UNESCO city of Guimarães. So we're going to have the opportunity to, to, to see the city and, and, and there will be a tour each day. And uh, also we're going to offer all the participants the open access to the final conference of cost action 1406 on quality specifications for bridges that will be held on the University of Minho on the 24th and 25th of March. The venue is a combination of uh, contemporary with uh, old. Uh, so it is, uh, it was, uh, it is Villa Flor Cultural Center, which was a uh, uh, 18th century Villa Flor Palace. And it was added uh, a new, a new uh, facilities that uh, uh, for the cultural capital of cultural, when Guimarães was capital of culture. And it is a very interesting venue with a lot of, uh, of uh, facilities. It is also, Guimarães is a small city. We can walk around from the university to the venue is uh, five, 10 minutes walking. And if you stay in any of these hotels, uh, you can walk to the venue, the maximum is 15 minutes. And uh, the prices are very competitive also for hotels and for meals. So Guimarães, as I told you, is uh, the UNESCO, UNESCO city because it's the cradle of Portugal. Portugal born in Guimarães, in the, in the, in the castle of Guimarães, was the first one. And uh, it is located in the north of Portugal. And uh, very close, we have the National Park of Peneda Gires, which is a very nice park with uh, waterfalls and uh, wildlife and so on. You also have the Douro region. We also have Porto. Uh, both Douro and Porto are classified also as UNESCO heritage sites. And uh, you can, uh, on the weekend, easily you can go to, to, to Porto, to the Douro region, stay in a farm, a wine farm, and see these uh, fantastic landscapes, and also have the opportunity to taste the Douro wine and the port wine, the different ones. And if you want to stay in the city of Porto, uh, it's a must. You can see, you can visit the cellars, you can visit the old city, which is very interesting. So Guimarães is in the northwest of Portugal, as I told, is a cradle of uh, Portuguese nationality, and it was the European capital of culture. Uh, the airport of Porto is uh, very well connected. Now we have also, it's not updated, but we have uh, direct flights with Continental and uh, there will be also a Chinese, a Chinese airline going to Porto from Shanghai and Beijing from next year. So this is the airport. And from airports to Guimarães, you have different options with different time and different costs. So I think uh, Guimarães will be a very interesting place and uh, walkable where we can meet each other. And now you can see a little of Guimarães.
So see you next March in Portugal. I'm Jonathan McGormley, Chair of the Scientific Committee for New York, and I invite you to New York City. On behalf of the Organizing Committee and Chair Joseph Tortorella, we uh, encourage you to, uh, to come. And I'd like to talk a little bit in the next couple minutes about New York City and the Congress in 2019. So the U.S. group is hosting the conference. <clears throat> it will include a variety of, of activities. Uh, as you know, New York City, is a, as shown in the, in the screen there, has a wide variety of structures and, uh, and cultural activities to see. We, in, we intend to have numerous uh, tours offered, which included, as on the screen showing there, some of the uh, museums, skyscrapers. Uh, we have the 9-11 Museum, which is a very moving uh, location to see and witness. We also have uh, some very enjoyable food to partake. But right now, our focus is in obtaining abstracts. So as we just all got done learning about uh, uh, all the t uh, tomorrow's megastructures, we're going to move on to the evolving metropolis. And so you are invited to participate by submitting abstracts through November 1st of this year. And uh, as, we've, as I show on the screen there, we have two focus topics, which will be sessions that are run concurrently within the uh, Congress that are going to be focused on the 200-year bridge, somebody brought up the, the possibility of achieving 100 or 150, so we're throwing out 200 years. And then also the uh, ability to deal with housing in an urban area, so the, uh, tomorrow's affordable housing. Our intent is to invite uh, practicing professionals and young engineers to get in a collaborative environment and work for two days within the Congress, working on various uh, listening to presentations, as well as uh, activities, and there'll probably be a site visit. And then when we're done, each one of those two sessions will produce a white paper that will come out of the uh, Congress. So if you participate, you'll get your name included on a white paper that comes out from IAPC. In addition, we have all the other themes that are listed there as well, so we have a variety of opportunities for those of you practicing in those areas. So we invite you and encourage you to submit abstracts by the end of the, November, by the, end of the month of October. So the schedule starts as we do with our Congresses. We have the annual meetings. The view out here is uh, out on the East River. It happens to be during winter, so don't have to worry about that in September. But they'll be held in the offices of Silman Associates. Uh, and this, at this point, you'll be, the annual meetings will be held there, and then they'll conclude over at the Javits Center where the uh, venue will be. <clears throat> so for those who are participating in, the, in Congress will be at the Javits Center, September 4th, 5th, and 6th. It's on the Hudson River, right next to the Hudson River, and it uh, has a 
subway stop right next by and then takes you back towards the Times Square where many of the hotels are located. And so it's easy access, easy uh, locations to the heart of Manhattan. And so I'll show you a little brief section about the Javits. So on the screen shows a couple of the venues that we uh, anticipate uh, having either tours or activities in. On the, on the left-hand side is the High Line, which is a reclaimed uh, transportation railroad section through Manhattan. It's a mile long, approximately, and has a, it's a great venue to walk and see the city from a different perspective. Uh, up the, the center top are the reflecting pools from the 9-11 Museum, as is the lower, le uh, lower right is inside the museum. We'll also have an architectural boat tours along uh, the, the island of Manhattan. And then if we get the chance, you can see a Yankees game, uh, which is American baseball on, uh, at, the, at the Yankee Stadium. So again, we're looking forward to a, a wide variety of activities and a wide variety of technical presentations. In New York City at this time of year, it can, it's weather that it's hard to beat what we've had in Nantes, but it well, should be very similar. So we look forward to uh, the uh, very positive weather. And then as well, as we go forward, I'd like to again encourage you to uh, submit abstracts and uh, participate and indicate where you'd like to participate in those abstracts because there uh, should be locations where you can say, hey, I want to be part of, uh, of a working group or so forth. And with that, I'd like to again thank all those who helped uh, with NON. It's been a fabulous time. New York City is a little bit bigger, but I don't think it can be uh, any more friendly than here in Nantes. So I uh, hope we can do as well as what you've done here. But again, we invite you all to New York in September of next year. Thank you very much. So some more information uh, saves the date, just to, to mention that uh, according to the decision taken by the technical committee in Nantes, so the next uh, IAPS, IABSC conference is in Roklo, Poland, and you see the date from uh, 20 to 22 May uh, 2025, and, and 20, excuse me. The IAPSC Congress uh, in the year 2020, from August 31 to September 4, in Christchurch, New Zealand. And I think that Alessandro Palermo, from the University of Canterbury, in Christchurch, Christ is present uh, and can give you information on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is now time to conclude this symposium. I would like to thank all the members of the scientific committee, and especially Christian Cremona and André Orsesi, who did a, a great job. All my colleagues and friends of the organizing committee, and all the volunteers who helped us. The president of IABSC, Chep, Cecil, and all the nice staff of IABSC. The sponsors of the symposium, our platinum sponsor, Fresine, our four gold sponsors, 
Holplan, Bentley, Maurer, Vinci. Our three silver sponsors, Fastbeam, Mageba, and Mistras. And our coffee break sponsors, Civetea and Construiracier. The staff of the, of the, the excuse me, the supporting organizations, uh, CSTB, IFSTAR, Université de Nantes, Central Nantes, the ECCE and Nantes Metropole, and all our exhibitors. The staff of the Nantes Event Center, our six keynote speakers, all the speakers and the governors in the sessions, the contributors to the three workshops, the PhD students who performed as best as possible, and all the persons involved in the technical visits and in the post-symposium tour that will begin tomorrow and which will be the opportunity to see the Terenez Bridge as uh, Michel Virloge show, show you uh, a few minutes ago. I hope that you enjoyed this event as well as the city of Nantes, and I thank you all for your participation. I now officially close this symposium and wish you all a safe trip back home. Thank you. <laughs>